This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garrett. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Founded by Jim Kramer, TheStreet.com is an independent source for stock market analysis. Kramer's Action Alerts Plus service is home to his multi-million dollar portfolio. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Stock market chill February continues where January left off. In a deep freeze, the Dow plunges 300 points. The Nasdaq closes below 4,000. Small caps touch correction territory. Bond yields fall as gold rallies. What's pulling the market lower and where can you find protection? This is a special market sell-off edition of Nightly Business Report for Monday, February 3rd. Good evening, everyone. Sell, sell, and more selling. That was the story on Wall Street today. On this first trading day of February, stocks got slammed. Market pros have been calling for a correction, and it looks like the major market averages edged closer to, to correction territory today. So what happened? A weak report about manufacturing activity in the U.S. worried investors, adding to the anxiety. China reporting that its factory sector is also not growing much. That was enough to push the major averages down 2 percent or more in one of the most volatile days in trading in seven months. Here are the closing numbers on Wall Street. The Dow plunged 326 points. That's a 2 percent decline. The blue chip average is now down 7 percent for 2014. The Nasdaq tumbled nearly 100. 107 points, closing below the key 4,000 mark for the first time since December of last year. And the S&P lost 40 points, with all 10 of its sectors in the red. In the bond market, prices rose and yields fell, the yield on the 10-year note dropping below 2.6 percent. Bob Pisani has more on what stocks and sectors were hit the hardest today and the mood of traders at the New York Stock Exchange. Stock sold off today with the Dow closing at a three and a half month low. The market started to the downside, but then it took another leg down in the late morning when January manufacturing data and the auto sales both came in weaker than expected. Though everybody cited the weather, concerns about a slightly weaker U.S. economy on top of worries about emerging markets left traders in an unforgiving mood. It was an orderly but a broad sell off with almost all sectors down two to three percent. Even defensive groups like healthcare and consumer staples were down 2%. The volume was very heavy today. It was one of the heaviest days in a year, in fact, suggesting that many professional traders were lightening up on their exposure to stocks. The bottom line, most traders thought bonds would continue to drop and the yields would rise in 2014 and that stocks would move up. So far, that consensus has been completely wrong, but then again, it often is. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Sell-offs, corrections, bear markets. Where does one end and another begin? Why, it's not just a matter of semantics and where you might take cover in today's suddenly volatile market. Dominic Chu has our report. The stock market's gotten off to a rocky start, and that's got investors worried. This time, many are blaming it on weakness in emerging market countries like Brazil and Russia. Still others are saying it's not just those countries, but bigger developed markets like Japan. Its stock market has already entered a correction, dropping by 10 percent in value since its recent highs. But is a pullback in stocks really something to be feared? Take a look at the last time we had a pronounced correction for U.S. stocks. It was between April 29th and October 4th of 2011. The S&P 500 lost 18 percent in that time frame. Among the worst performing stocks were cyclical ones, the ones with the most exposure to the ups and downs of the bigger picture economy. In that last correction, financials, materials and energy stocks all were hit the hardest. Think banks like Regions Financial and oil companies like Marathon Oil. Conversely, the stocks that weren't as impacted by economic weakness fared better. The so-called defensive stocks, utilities, consumer staples companies, they didn't fall nearly as much. Think Duke Energy and Colgate Palmolive. After all, we all still use electricity, gas, toothpaste and paper towels, even if times are tough. Many traders and investors are placing their bets on these kinds of companies, depending on what their market view is. But one shouldn't lose too much sleep over the drop in stocks in 2014, at least not according to Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Corrections aren't that unusual. So, you know, we went back over the last few decades and we found that 5% 
pullbacks happen on average about three times a year. Um, so I think that what we're seeing right now is just kind of the normal, uh, a normal phenomenon. So whatever your view, keep a close eye on cyclical and defensive stocks for where the action's going to be. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. So what's going on in the markets and why now and what should you do about it? Let's turn to three market experts for their analysis. Anastasia Amoroso, she's global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Funds. Anika Khan, senior economist at Wells Fargo. And Tom Luster, co-director of fixed income at Eaton Vance. And thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. Anastasia, let me, let me begin with you and just ask you, how much more selling are we in for and how serious is this really? Well, today has certainly been a disappointing day, um, but, but I think I would agree with the analysis that the markets have been ripe for a correction for some time. I mean, we're coming off a very exceptionally strong 2013, and we've had an exceptionally strong the last five years, so the markets were set up for a correction. Um, how far does the pullback go? You know, the worry today is that we did break through some pretty critical levels, and perhaps there's more to this downside, but everything needs to be kept in perspective. And I think what's so important for investors to do right now is to assess not only how to protect their portfolios, but also how to take advantage of this opportunity, because that's exactly what we see here today, is that with the stock having pulled, uh, pulled off some of the, the highs, the buy list should be looked at very carefully right, right now. Anika, an awful lot of people have been citing some weaker economic numbers uh, and citing everybody's favorite excuse, the weather. How weak have these numbers been and how, how really justifiable is the excuse that it, a lot of it is weather related? Yeah, it's a great question because most of it really is weather related. Even if you look at the ISM Manufacturing Index report, respondents specifically noted it was the weather. And it's not just weather. We typically get cold weather in December. Um, it was unseasonably cold weather. Um, and so it not only had an impact on ISM manufacturing, but we also saw durable goods as well as an, a host of housing market indicators um, that were hit as a result. Um, as we look forward um, to the next two months, it's very likely that some of those housing market indicators could be weak, but other indicators should start to come back. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Tom, let, let me turn to you. It seems like all of our reporting and also what we're hearing uh, from the other panelists here is that this is all kind of normal sell-off correction sort of stuff, but the bond market doesn't seem to be behaving like everything is okay here. We saw that the yield on the 10-year was around 3% at the beginning of January. Now it's below 2.6%. In bond market terms, that's a huge move. How critical is this, and what is it telling us? Uh, well, certainly um, what, what we've seen is, uh, as, as you mentioned, about a 40 basis point decline in the 10-year Treasury. I think it's a classic example of uh, risk on, uh, go, going from a risk on trade to a risk off trade. Um, selling stocks and buying Treasury bonds as a safe haven. Um, you know, we've seen this numerous times uh, over the past five years since the credit crisis. And I think it's another good uh, of a, you know, example of it happening again. Anastasia, let's turn to what I should do with my money. Uh, should I do anything in this context uh, if my portfolio is uh, relatively diversified? Uh, and if I want to play defense, and we saw Seattle win with defense yesterday, uh, what should I do to play defense intelligently? I think there's definitely room for both. So let me start with the defense first. Uh, it's absolutely for, for the investors where the critical objective is to protect principal. Absolutely, there's room for safety in the portfolio. And that's why we do turn to safe haven treasuries. And specifically on the longer end of the spectrum, they have done very, uh, very, very well. Longer, longer uh, term of the maturity spectrum. Uh, also, you know, within equities, investors could rebalance away from the cyclical stocks, such as industrial, such as materials that are very heavily tied to this emerging market trade and focus more on the defensive sectors. But I wouldn't say that this is the only thing that investors should do. In fact, I would say that the investors should be skewed towards looking at the opportunities that lie under the surface here, specifically within actually the S&P cyclical stocks and also European cyclical stocks. They have been hit quite hard because of the emerging market fears. But in reality, those are the exact economies that are driving the global recovery, not the other way around. 
Anika, let me ask you about what role the Fed plays in all this and how it might impact the decisions that investors should make with their personal portfolios. A lot of talk today that this was the first day that Janet Yellen is serving as uh, the chief of the Federal Reserve, and, and now she's faced with this uh, market condition and maybe changes in the economy. If there's any change in Fed policy about this whole taper business, maybe less tapering, how will that impact investors? Would this be a positive or a negative for investors in the markets? Yeah, the Fed is still going to be very data dependent. It's going to look at its dual mandate. What is the labor market doing? What is inflation doing? And of course, we expect the employment and labor market to continue to increase. Um, what is inflation doing? It's at a very low rate today. But the Fed definitely um, will use um, how much to taper um, as another policy tool. The Fed has said it's not on a preset course. Um, and so that means in light of softer data, they could decide not to taper in the March meeting. Um, however, if you look at the Fed's projections, they are looking at better data for 2014 and 2015, which also coincides with better private sector data as well. Tom, uh, if I had bought bonds on January 2nd, I'm feeling pretty smart right now, the 10-year uh, Treasury, that is, given the, the fall in interest rates. But what is your outlook for the rest of this year, and what should I do uh, to position my bond portfolio in light of your outlook? Well, Tyler, uh, I, I do think what's going on right now is a, in a, is a correction in what's otherwise an upward-trending uh, stock market and upward-trending rates uh, as well. Um, so we've been suggesting to our uh, to our fixed income clients certainly that they uh, avoid interest rate risk and uh, in lieu of that where they do need some more income, uh, they'd probably be better off taking some credit risk in order to get it. So staying short in duration, as we call it, keeping your interest rate risk low uh, and taking on some credit risk, buying some corporate bonds, uh, being invested in high yield and bank loans and, and those sorts of uh, uh, sectors in the bond market uh, in order to generate some attractive return. Anastasia, we have half a minute. Real quickly, do you agree with that? What kind of bonds to put in the portfolio? And number two, what about gold? It had a nice move today. Absolutely. I agree with the credit statement. I think what you want to own in fixed income right now is the sectors that have sensitivity to an impro improving economic environment. And high yield bonds certainly do. Convertible bonds certainly do. So it's a buying opportunity here. Gold long term, we think the catalysts are just not there. So it, it might be a short term bounce here. All right, Anastasia, thank you so much. Thank you all, Anastasia you. Amoroso, Anika Khan, and Tom Luster. We really appreciate your input tonight. Well, while stocks did head lower today, the price of safe haven commodities went up, especially gold we were just talking about. Jackie DeAngelis now has more on why the precious metal is getting renewed attention these days. Gold prices rallying today, popping as much as $25 intraday, and traders say bullion could be staging a rebound. And why are investors flocking to gold? Well, when the equity markets are volatile, as they have been recently, investors flee the stock market for safer investments like gold. Right now, it looks like a perfect storm is brewing for gold bugs. There's multiple concerns out there, including growth in emerging markets in China, but also what's happening here at home. Recent data showing that the U.S. economy may not be rebounding as quickly as everyone hoped, coupled with the Federal Reserve scaling back its bond buying program and questions over earnings and guidance from corporations. And history tells us that when the going gets tough, traders flock to gold. Remember the great debt ceiling debate of 2011? The U.S. lost its AAA credit rating. Gold prices rallied and hit a record closing high of 1888.70 in August that year. So how high will prices go this time? Traders are saying it's difficult to say exactly. But if the global markets continue to see more volatility, they do expect gold to continue to shine. Maybe not to those record levels, but they are looking for it to recoup some of its more than 30 percent losses that it saw in 2013. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis reporting from the NYMEX. And coming up, Treasury Secretary Liu issues another warning to Congress. Act now because time is running out to lift the debt ceiling. Will this be the next big headache for investors?
January's rough weather spelled trouble for auto sales. Another bit of news that did nothing to cheer investors today. General Motors saw sales fall almost 12 percent. Ford and Toyota reported a drop of seven. But Chrysler did buck the trend with an 8 percent year-over-year increase. But it wasn't just the automakers that felt a chill from the weather, but also the airlines. Phil LeBeau has more. From long lines at airports to no lines in showrooms, the auto and airline industries had a terrible month in January. How bad? GM, Toyota and Ford all saw sales drop last month, while Chrysler was up. But all of them posted weaker than expected sales, in part because of snowstorms keeping people from visiting dealerships. When the second polar vortex hit, I think that's when, uh, you know, sales dipped again. And with sales closing this past Friday, there was really no time to recover those sales. When you look at where auto sales fell in January, it's the eastern half of the U.S. From Chicago to Atlanta to New York, bad weather wreaked havoc, as it did for the airline industry. I think it's safe to say it can't get any worse. Uh, January was an all-time uh, low point, so to speak, for the airline business when it comes to cancellations. Altogether, 49,000 flights were canceled last month, and thousands more were delayed, impacting 30 million passengers. Moss Flights says changing flights, scrubbing trips, booking and rebooking hotels cost travelers $2.5 billion. Those hardest hit? People flying regional jets often to smaller cities. And the airlines try to prioritize the aircraft that have the most number of people on board. And that's why you see the smaller airplanes that are operated by regional carriers canceled first so that the 200 or 300 passenger airplanes can take priority in the system. While storm after storm made for a miserable January, executives in the airline and auto industries say they expect business to bounce back this month, provided Mother Nature cooperates. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. There could be some stormy weather in Washington, not from Mother Nature, but from lawmakers on Capitol Hill. The deadline to raise the nation's debt ceiling is this Friday. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew warned today that time is running out. He says that with tax refunds starting to go out, his office will run out of what he calls extraordinary measures to keep the government open for business by the end of this month if Congress doesn't lift the nation's borrowing limit. And at the beginning of tax filing season, tax refunds result in net cash flows that deplete borrowing capacities very quickly. We now forecast that we're likely to exhaust these measures by the end of the month. A temporary suspension of the debt limit was passed by Congress last year, but that expires this Friday. John Harwood joins us now from Washington. John, let me just begin by asking you about, you know, how investors are going to respond to all of uh, this uh, stuff going on in Washington. Up until now, there was this feeling like we don't have to worry. There's going to be a bi bipartisan agreement and all of that. But now with this huge sell-off going on Wall Street, is this debt limit going to be another headache? Susie, I think investors should watch and monitor. I don't think there's reason yet to be overly concerned about this for the simple reason that Republicans, who have the ones uh, been holding up the debt limit in the past, realize that that is uh, something that could hurt them politically. They're heading into an election year in which things are otherwise looking good. They don't want to get away in the way of their own good news. So I think it is likely that this gets resolved in a uh, non-crisis atmosphere. So the damsel will be taken off the railroad tracks one more time. But what is the nature of the solution there? Are they going to give, uh, are the Republicans going to give a blank check to the debt limit raise or what? I think the nature of the solution, Tyler, is not uh, exactly a blank check. It uh, revolves around something that makes Republicans feel like they can tell their conservative base that we got some sort of concession. Last mm -hmm. uh, A year ago at this time, it was no budget, no pay. If the Senate doesn't pass a budget, they won't get paid. Of course, they did, uh, and everybody forgot about that issue. So it's a matter of coming up with some fig leaf for the speaker to be able to tell conservatives, I got the best we could, but let's focus on the things that we think work for us uh, like Obamacare, not go back into that debt limit mess. So if everything goes according to plan, what is the timetable here? Well, uh, as you noted, uh, the uh, uh, debt limit, uh, we hit it on Friday. Then you have extraordinary measures. But because the government's going to be paying so much in tax refunds, there isn't the length of time that members have become used to. They've become used to this dragging on for months past the date. Uh, now, the economy is fairly strong at the moment, so that 
pr could provide some additional cushion. But right now, Jack Lew is saying by the end of this month, by the end of February, uh, and so that's the target that they've all got to shoot for right now. So another countdown for us to keep track of. Thank you yes. so much, John. John Harwood reporting from Washington. Well, watching the sell-off in the market closely is the new chair of the central bank. Janet Yellen, who says, I'm the chair, not the chairwoman, was sworn in today as the first female chair of the Federal Reserve. The oath was administered in the Fed's boardroom by Fed Governor Daniel Tarullo. And her predecessor, Ben Bernanke, will not join the long-term unemployed. Just three days removed from his post atop the Federal Reserve, Bernanke today took a position at the Washington think tank, the Brookings Institution. He'll be a distinguished fellow in residence at its Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. And coming up, as yields fall, so do mortgage rates. But for how long? And could Friday's jobs report send them back in the other direction? Despite the massive sell-off on Wall Street today, Pfizer was the only Dow component that was up today. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Pfizer said an experimental breast cancer drug met study goals in a mid-stage trial. The treatment is considered one of the drug maker's most valuable products in development. Some analysts believe it could account for annual sales of more than $5 billion if approved. Pfizer shares rose a fraction to $30.60. AT&T's move to make customers happy left investors disappointed. It announced a 20 percent price cut for customers who share large data plans. It's an attempt to gain ground lost to Verizon and T-Mobile. Many on Wall Street are expecting Verizon to follow AT&T's lead. But at and shares still tumbled 4 percent to 31.95. Verizon also down, losing more than 3 percent to $46.41. Now, after the market closed, Yum! Brands, this is the parent of KFC and Pizza Hut, reported earnings that came in higher than estimates, but revenues missed. Overall, comparable sales were down, which analysts didn't expect, and they fell 4 percent in China. That's Yum!'s top market. The company did reaffirm, though, its guidance for the year. Shares were up initially after hours. In the regular session, Yum!'s shares were down by 1.5 percent to $66.16. Herbalife, the nutritional supplements company, is estimating its fourth quarter profit and sales will come in above the market forecast. The company also upped its buyback program to $1.5 billion. The stock surged toward the end of the day, up 7 percent to 69.02 on a very rugged day in the market. Joseph A. Bank has rejected Men's Warehouse's latest takeover offer again. Bank says the $1.5 billion bid substantially undervalues the company. At the same time, there are reports that Joseph A. Bank is in talks to buy the retailer Eddie Bauer. It is owned by the private equity firm Golden Gate Capital. Shares of both Bank and Men's Warehouse tumbled today. Bank off 5 percent to 53.39. Men's Warehouse plunged almost 8 percent to $44.31. And L Brands, the parent of uh, Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works, raised its annual dividend by 13 percent and declared a special dividend of a dollar a share. Share was going to be paid on March 7th. Still, the stock was down nearly 3 percent to $50.87. While the markets are selling off and investors are rotating money into bonds, there is one upside in all this uncertainty. Mortgage rates, they're ticking lower. But with Friday's jobs report looming, is it time to lock in your mortgage rate right now? Diana Olick gets some answers. This winter's wallop has sent a chill across the economy, but it's also helping some borrowers by pushing mortgage rates lower. As investors flee the stock market, they're buying bonds, sending yields lower. Mortgage rates follow those yields. Some are viewing this as a bit of an anomaly so far. But uh, it's really only limited by how bad the situation gets for equities and, and the other markets that uh, investors are leaving. Last week, the average rate on the 30-year fixed fell to a three-month low, and rates dropped again today on weak manufacturing data. For the best borrowers, 4.25 percent is a real possibility. It's a quarter point drop in a week, barely $30 a month saved on a $200,000 loan, but it means a lot more. If that quarter of a percent happens to take rates to 
say, the lowest they've been in uh, several months or a year, then that psychological effect not only affects borrowers individually, but the industry makes a bigger deal about it. The downward slide in rates is really a double-edged sword. Rates are only going down because of concern in the broader economy. That concern has investors fleeing the stock market, and what's bad for the market is not good for the housing recovery. Affordability is not just about mortgage rates. It depends on your income, and if the economy does worse, more people stay out of work, incomes don't rise, that really hurts affordability. Despite the rate moves, credit is still tight as ever, and potential buyers remain leery. I think the biggest concern is consumer confidence, right? It's just a question of, can you get enough buyers to the table? Are people going to pause because they're not sure about the broader economic conditions? That's what builders are really worried about. The decline in mortgage rates may be short-lived, especially if the employment report Friday delivers good news. That's why borrowers looking to refinance might want to lock in now and hedge their mortgage bets while the hedging is still good. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. To read more about mortgage rates and where they might be heading, go to our website, nbr.com. And that wraps up our special market sell-off edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Susie Garrett. Thanks for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Founded by Jim Cramer, TheStreet.com is an independent source for stock market analysis. Cramer's Action Alerts Plus service is home to his multi-million dollar portfolio. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. On this first trading day of February, stocks got slammed with the major averages edging closer to correction territory. Today's sell-off was fueled by worries about weak manufacturing activity in the U.S. and in China. Here's how the major averages ended the session. The Dow plunged 326 points, a 2 percent decline. The blue chip average is now down 7 percent for 2014. The Nasdaq tumbled nearly 107 points, closing below the key 4,000 mark for the first time since December of last year. And the S&P lost 40 points with all 10 sectors in the red. And wicked winter weather getting the blame for a 3 percent drop in new auto sales last month. General Motors took the brunt of it, with sales down 12 percent. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.